Hello and welcome to this week's webinar. We're delighted to have you here and thank you all so much again for joining us on this Thursday afternoon. Alistair and I are going to be talking everything handbags today, which uh, is a delight for me, but more so Alistair too. <laughs> well, it's, it's one of my favourite subjects, shall we say, Rachel, but yes, more than, more than happy to talk about it for a little time. I was going to say, last week we had the wonderful uh, Jenny Knott talking about hallmarks. Um, I have to say, I truly enjoyed her webinar. It was fun, exciting. The two of you together were just magical and uh, I learned a lot. You know, it was really it, good fun. It was really good fun. I think the great thing and the thing that always shows is people's enthusiasm for these subjects and Jenny's enthusiasm for silver and hallmarks obviously was very, very clear to see. And because of this, and obviously all the fantastic comments we've had from some of our viewers, we're now going to actually move on and do a, a webinar on silver items and what's hot and what's not. And I, and I say not with a K-N-O double T. <laughs> so uh, yes, that, that'll be, that'll be awesome. <laughs> Jenny Knott will be very impressed. <laughs> Indeed, I thought that. <laughs> so no, um, well this week obviously we're, we're talking handbags and as we know um, you've just been involved in the most wonderful collection uh, that we did for a client that was very interesting and um, went across quite a few periods and dates and, and you know she, she had some uh, exciting older pieces as well as new ones. I think the great thing about handbags is I think we've got a modern fascination with a lot of bags such as the Birkin and the, the Kelly, but which we'll come on to later. But I think the handbag market and the way in which handbags have been collectible has been around for, for decades, if not centuries. And the client that we went to see, um, they had some phenomenal pieces from the 50s and the 60s, um, some, some classic Fendi bags, um, which are beautiful little baguettes um, and made exquisitely with lovely kind of Berlin beadwork type things and some that are just completely out there which is kind of one of my favorite kind of things really when it's just out of the ordinary and I'm, I'm not saying this because you know I, I see hundreds and hundreds of Birkins but when you see hundreds and hundreds of Birkins and you're differentiating between them because you know of a different color and it can make a complete difference when you've got these items that are, are literally just so out there and completely bizarre it really does does make the whole kind of subject matter seem so much more interesting. I was going to say as well, handbags suddenly have, have become very collectible. Um, we see on, on many valuations that we're including their wardrobe as well as their handbags and, and even sunglasses, which I know you're going to do uh, a webinar on shortly. Yes, <laughs> another one of my unfortunate uh, loves. Yes, indeed. But why are prices with handbags suddenly escalating? You know, why are suddenly we're including them in valuations where previously they maybe not have been as detailed as what we're going into today? Um, I think it's I think it's a question of people are buying different things that they're really longing for and really valuing themselves. So I think one of the few things I think we've seen in the last 20 years, especially, has been watches, handbags, cars. And I would describe them as this fantastic thing called a Veeblin kind of item, which effectively is something that there isn't quite necessarily the amount of supply that people want to have, but it keeps them coming back and they think, oh gosh, I've got to have this. And I think that's why. And I think so, for example, with a, a Rolex Submariner, one of the LV models, for example, with a green bezel, it's always going to be in demand because there is just not enough of them. And um, with certain sports cars, for example, there is just slightly not enough of them. So they will remain in demand and the secondary market will be absolutely huge on them. And a similar thing, unfortunately, well, fortunately for people like Hermes, has happened with, with handbags. Now, some of these things are released in such small numbers. And when you consider list prices on these, are, generally speaking, 12 to 20 grand on most kind of Birkin 25, 30s, then as soon as they hit the secondary market, then they're, they're almost double that in, in some situations, if not more. And I think this whole kind of financial kind of situation has meant that they have just become ever more collectible and people are looking at bags that they bought maybe you know in, in the first kind of you know incarnation of the Birkin in the 80s or the late 80s and they're saying oh gosh this is this is going to be you know 
not a lot of money and actually it turns out it's worth a small fortune i mean in that collection for example there are a couple of 1980s birkins that i think they they, they may have just thought were a little bit tired and old but actually of all of them they were the ones if if, if i were a lady that i would actually own um, and they're really really gorgeous things i mean obviously you've mentioned some makes to me um, but obviously the birkin probably is yeah the most expensive and most known bag, I would say, um, yeah. around. If you put Jennifer Aniston, you know, on the front cover of Hello or Vogue or whatever, with a new Birkin or or any media post, social media, suddenly that that bag is is hot to trot. Um, but I one think I think I think the Birkin is effectively there. There, there are two bags or two two designers, shall we say, that people know in, in handbags. The Birkin is the first one and Hermes is, is just, you know, considered to be the top dog of it. Second, I think would actually probably go to, to Louis Vuitton. I mean, everyone knows that the Louis Vuitton monogram logo and most people own a, you know, a clutch bag or a handbag or something along those lines. Now, I'm just gonna show you a fantastic, well, fantastically opulent, uh, I think is the better word for it, Birkin. Now, this one actually uh, was sold uh, a little while ago, and uh, it was about three years ago. So you've actually got a Niloticus crocodile. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, because I've never, I, my, my, my knowledge on crocodiles isn't particularly brilliant. I was going to say, is the clasp diamond encrusted, or am of I course imagining it is. that? Yes, yes, it is. Eight, eight, 18 karat white gold with diamonds on it and, and crocodile skin. Um, and the, the crocodile is only found in a, in a very specific part of Africa. And uh, yeah, so this one was put together and this one made 230,000 pounds, which is colossal. Now this is a particularly special one and obviously not something you're gonna actually wear out unless you are particularly flamboyant, which uh, I sometimes have that moniker, but uh, yes, it's uh, absolutely, uh, I mean, an amazing but bag. But again, I think so I understand with Birkins, and yeah. correct me uh, if I'm wrong, Alistair, but it does depend on the price, depending on what it is actually made of, but also what the finish is, because if it is like this, um, a non-gloss finish, you can't hide imperfections. You've got different. You've got different types of leather. Um, so, for example, the standard Birkin is, is manufactured in something called calf leather. Then there's an Epsom leather, um, and there's about six or eight different types of leather. And it all actually. I mean, you can get a yellow bag that looks exactly the same, but if you feel it, like an Epsom leather, for example, is really stiff, so it maintains its shape really well. And some people want that, but some people want a bag that actually kind of flexes a bit, and you can put things in it. So I mean, I mean, we forget that the. the I mean, the, the Birkin. I mean, the, this was designed um, by Jean. Louis Dumas. And the reason why this was actually designed was he, he was sat next to Jane Birkin on a plane and she had a straw handbag effectively or a straw weekend bag. And as she was putting it up in the locker, it all fell out. And, oh, yeah. uh, and he was thinking, OK, well, what can I do with this? And she was complaining that, you know, she can't find a good weekend bag. So this was actually designed after being sat next to Jane Birkin on a plane and uh, having a bit of a rubbish bag. So it was designed for that, but it was designed as a weekend bag in order that it could be used. So it's kind of transformed. We do like to keep a lot in our handbags. <laughs> well, I, I, I like to keep a lot in my bag as well. Tape, measure, scales, you name it. Everything of value and needs. But, but Alistair, you, you mentioned there a price that it had sold for. Yeah. Now, obviously, that was in the secondary market. Yeah, indeed. Uh, at auction. Mm -hmm. Now, if the owner had to replace that one could they replace it and if so what would it cost today to try uh, and you could, no, that, that, that was a one-off piece that you, the one -off. You, just, you just couldn't replace now if you were to look at replace it i mean if you were looking at insuring it you're it's nigh on impossible to be, but if you were looking at saying okay what would the market be and if it came to market what would it sell for now I think you're probably looking at close to half a million pounds, I would have thought around that kind of figure. Because these things, I mean, since that as well, the market was strong, but it's just, I mean, it's gone up an immeasurable amount of in, in that time as well. I mean, to put it in context, I'm just gonna show you a, another Birkin, which is quite interesting because it looks 
relatively normal in the whole grand scheme of things. I say relatively normal. Um, I mean, what it, makes the Birkin collectible? Is, is it condition? Is it colour? It's, it's a combination of colour and um, hardware. Well, I mean, this one, for example, uh, this is a metallic bronze, which you can't quite tell. It looks kind of yellow, but it is a metallic bronze. But this came, and this is quite a small one. It's a 25. So you've got the 25, the 30, and the 35. Generally speaking, the 30 or the 35 are the most popular because you can get the most in them. But this was made um, with uh, 18 karat gold hardware. And yeah, I mean, this was just a really, really interesting kind of mix because generally with the bronze, you'd possibly put it on palladium. Again, you can have palladium, uh, you can have uh, silver. There are lots of different options that they've actually explored. So, so these, these are the metal quality. So in other words, the clasps, the lock, the feet. Exactly. Exactly. So, I mean, there's a lot of them out there. I mean, the, the 90s ones generally, a lot of them have got gold plate on them and, you know, but they, they've experimented a lot over the years. And again, it's it's the scarcity of it. I mean, it's not the fact that obviously gold costs more than other metals. It's just it's just the difference in them. So, I mean, this one looks like a relatively normal bag. And I, I should say when that was actually purchased, it was probably I mean, it's a it's a good one. It was probably about 20, 25 grand. But when that was actually sold, um, that, this was back in 2017, this actually sold for £100,000 in, uh, in euros, uh, it was 109500 So it's a, it's, it's, it's a heck of a lot of money for something that you can buy something relatively similar to, but it wouldn't be exactly the same, if you see what I mean. And that, that, that's what kind of makes the difference, if you see what but I mean. But isn't the question, what do you buy a lady that has everything, um, another Birkin handbag? Well, a Birkin or a Kelly. I mean, if I'm being honest, I really like the Kelly bag. And the Kelly bag, generally speaking, is actually about half the price when, when you take it into consideration. And, you know, whilst, whilst I couldn't get away with carrying one, I think I would probably opt for that just because it's quite a lot less. And I think, I think actually the Kelly is obviously, I'm pretty sure we've got a, a nice picture of a Kelly as well, because the Kelly is kind of a, I, I think, well, actually, this is a really good example here. Now, that, I think, is, is, is a really, really, really pretty bag. That's actually, um, let me just find the details on this one. So this one... A smaller bag. Yeah, it's slightly smaller. But this was a really, really good example of when, I mean, I'll give you a brief history here of what happened with, with, with kind of handbag sales and how the market really really changed so the first proper handbag sale was actually back in in 1978 and it was actually coco chanel's collection so there's lots of chanel items in there and obviously the birkin hadn't been invented yet so it wasn't even kind of in in, in kind of in competition with it but it was rumored to be such a fantastic thing and it was christie's and christie's generally speaking have been the people that have been at the forefront of handbags for, for the last 20, 30, 40 years. But it was one of those weird things. I mean, people that were there, like the Duchess of Argyle, Baroness Olympia de Rothschild, um, and advisors from Marlene Dietrich and people like that. And one of the first bags that was actually sold was a lovely Chanel bag. Um, and it was just a navy blue flip bag bought by the Smithsonian Institute uh, for $800. So, again, that kind of sums up where the market was. But this one, um, this was from the first sale that really kind of was, it was, was the dawn of a new era, if I could be so grand as to say that, in, in handbag sales, where people were looking at them going, these are going to make some money now. And it was, you know, a really, really good investment. So this was back in 2007. And Christie's actually did a sale called From City Chic to Alpine Retreat, which I actually think sums up, sums up Hermes bags brilliantly. And you can see just a really, really, really gorgeous quality bag. And this one actually made 31,700 quid nice. um, back in 2007. And again, this is literally on that dawn of when all of these things were happening and when this market was, you know, starting to blow up. So the Kelly, I think, in many ways is actually a far more, I'm, I know the Queen's got a couple of Kellys as well. So I think it's, it's a good example of something that's a nice, elegant bag and a little bit less money than a Birkin. Uh, well, again, by Hermes. But if you look at the hierarchy, I mean, it, it, I suppose if, if you look at jewellery, you know, uh -huh. if you've got a Cartier piece, obviously their history goes back. Um, and Chanel as well, you know, a long period of time. 
So who were the first people, and, and I, I, you may not know the answer, Alistair, but who was the first people to actually make a handbag? I don't know off the top of my head. I would imagine um, there are lots Sorry, of... that was very cruel of me. <laughs> no, no, no it's, 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 no, it's a totally legitimate question. Yeah. Um, I think in terms of the way they've been forged, pushed forward in terms of fashion, um, I would say definitely Chanel. But people have always had that kind of handbag in terms of, and I see lots of really, really beautiful late Victorian Edwardian handbags that actually kind of have a nice kind of silver finish to them and have hallmark silver kind of markings on them. And they were always incredibly well made and incredibly good quality. But of all the brands that we're talking about, Chanel probably were the first people to come up with something that you could call an iconic designer handbag um, and let's see if we've just got a, an image of something that you know everyone associates with Chanel so that's a, uh, oh, a one two one one um, absolutely gorgeous piece there um, Karl Lagerfeld was obviously involved in the design of all these quilted bags that he, they were putting out at the time um, and again you can do something with them they're practical they're not just you know fashion pieces and you know they're really really well made items as well and they will last you a lifetime I mean that quilted leather is actually really really good quality and I've, I've had my hands on thousands of them and none of them actually ever get old they, they just get more weathered and look better in my opinion. I was going to say it sort of looks as though it would test the time of um, fashion as well I mean, I don't know when that piece dates, but it could have been an 80s handbag or it could have been a handbag from today. Exactly. You know, with that little the, gold strap, you know, yeah. well, running the, the, through. The gold chain with the leather strap has always been that kind of Chanel kind of look. And you can get the smaller handbags with exactly the same thing. But the envelope bag, so the smaller version of that, which is literally about the size of a piece of an A5 piece of paper, has been copied so much as well. Just a small little, it's almost a clutch bag but on a nice strap, so Yves Saint Laurent have copied it, um, Louis Vuitton have copied it. It's just a nice kind of size. But in terms of, I, I would say probably Chanel are, are they the most influential? I think they probably would be the most influential in terms of designs over the years. Not necessarily the most, I mean, the, the most iconic, obviously, if we go back to Birkin, but it's, um, again, I think- uh, And the most expensive bag today is the Birkin? Oh, without any doubt. I mean, there, there, there's some fantastic books out there that I've actually read. I think the last one I read was called In Search of the Birkin. <laughs> and it basically, it leads you through the process of trying to buy a Birkin bag. So let's say you or I go to New Bond Street this afternoon and say, hi, I would like to buy a Birkin. Well, may maybe not me, because they kind of know me. But if, if, you, if, if, if you were go to go to Bond Street and say, I would like to buy a Birkin, the answer you will receive, guaranteed, is we, 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 don't, we don't have them here. We don't, we don't sell them. Um, and if we were to have them in, they would have been reserved a long time ago. They may have them there but that is what they will tell you. The yeah. key is coming back to that Veblen items again, whereby people desire them because you can't get them. You have to be, in order to buy a, a good Hermes bag, I mean, a Kelly, not so much, but a Birkin. If you want to go and buy a Birkin from Hermes, you need to have a traceable shopping history with them from about 18 months to two years. You probably need to have spent a good six figure amount with them um, in, in history in order to be able to go, okay, I want this. And that is because their demand is so high and yeah. also they have a client base that is buying on a regular basis. Exactly. I mean, one of my clients um, will spend about 200 to 250,000 pounds a season, not a year, a season. So each season she would go to Bottega Veneta, for example, and they would have the bags lined up for her and she would have to buy every one, even if she didn't like them, because what would happen then is if she didn't buy them, she wouldn't get invited to look at the next selection, the next season. And it's all about this, this missing out thing. And that there is this fantastic, um, Bottega Veneta is a, is a very, very well-known handbag and their style is, is very much of its own. It's a weaved kind of leather kind of pattern. And she had the most beautiful white kind of an ivory colored one that she took to Wimbledon. And she went to Wimbledon one day, she, she wore it and she couldn't be seen with the same thing the same on, on, on the next day. So it got shelved and she, she used it once and that was it. And, uh, you She'll know, bring it out again. She'll bring it out again. <laughs> <laughs> but again, 
so we're looking at obviously the retail market um yeah. there is a huge secondary market in this area which yeah. again i mean if you type on you know google birkin handbags you can see that the secondary market is very active and i think the cheapest second hand three-year-old is around about sort of 18 20 yeah. so you know and that's for a second hand bag you know that, that's you know potentially being used and there will be um signs of wear now if you're looking to replace and you are we looking at that secondary market or are we always looking at a, a retail replacement because sometimes the bags aren't available on the retail replacement element in, in, it, it, it's a very good question and it's a similar question to if i had a ferrari 250 gt california short wheelbase that just you, there aren't many out there. Would you be able to replace it like for like? Probably not because there aren't any on the market. However, they are out there. Now, the thing is the secondary market for handbags is now the main place where people look because if you go direct to Hermes again to go and buy one, you'll be told what you can buy. You're not gonna say, can I have it in this with this? You, 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 I mean, un unless, unless you are something in terms of a huge celebrity you wouldn't be able to dictate what they're going to actually manufacture so if you wanted to go and buy a Birkin today you would need to go to the secondary market there are lots of websites out there I'm not going to name them but you can see on quite a few of them what the general price is and you're quite right the cheapest you can get for a, a genuine good condition Birkin is about 18 19 thousand pounds however as soon as you get into the realms of um, you know a nice ostrich skin or again a crocodile skin or something like that the price absolutely escalates and we're talking four or five you know times more than that on on, on numerous occasions it's, it's unbelievable and it's all about the scarcity again it's all about the demand for that particular model but obviously when we're doing valuations we're not just looking for Birkins we obviously are looking at a cross range um, whether it's Louis Vuitton and we've seen prices of what Louis Vuitton luggage goes for and again um the cost i think one of my i mean louis vuitton luggage is hilarious in price i mean i'll just show you this really really lovely example here of, of, of some louis vuitton stuff and i i'm, I'm a big fan maybe, maybe not so much so of the, the, the handbags of these but this the, the luggage is i mean it's absolutely you know as you know it's just beautiful isn't it and it just captures that fantastic late victorian or it's french so late 19th century parisian uh, kind of impression and what I love about this is these are the Alza cases um, and these belong to Elizabeth Taylor now mm -hmm. these were sold uh, in 2011 and uh, believe it or not if, if you look actually at the, uh, the images you can see they've all got luggage tags that just have mine written on them which I love and I, I think that's just <laughs> phenomenal but anyway th these these are offered at a bizarrely low estimate of three to five thousand dollars which to be perfectly frank you couldn't buy the vanity case on the top for three to, mm. <laughs> three to five thousand dollars so they actually sold for a hundred and ten thousand dollars in the end um which to be honest in my mind it is still quite cheap because the funny thing is with the luggage you see people um with the nice big um steamer trunks and people use them as pieces of furniture these days and people yeah. paying eight yeah. eight twelve grand and some of the ones that have got the nice cross weave on them um you know you can pay up to 20 grand for a really nice banded louis vuitton truck um but that that design and that style obviously gets oh, they're beautiful they are beautiful. Oh, they're, they're gorgeous they're, 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 yeah. i mean we're talking about icons you're talking about the chanel 1211 you're talking about the birkin you're talking about the kelly this is this is on, on a similar playing field, if not potentially higher, because it is, you know, there is nothing like a Louis Vuitton trunk at all. But that, that's a really good example of, of where they're going in terms of that. But the, the actual um, handbags and clutch bags and things like that, it's still very widely available, but I think Louis Vuitton to a certain degree has suffered a little bit through over manufacture, whereas Hermes has kept it very, very restrictive and very, very, very elite. Um, Louis Vuitton are kind of at the, not the lower end, because it's still, you know, well-priced things, but, you know, you can go and buy a Louis Vuitton Speedy. Do you think they've been more affected by fakes? Well, I mean, the, the vast, I mean, thankfully with our clients, you don't see too many fakes, but if, if, if you walk down Kensington High Street, I would say five out of 10 
Louis Vuitton bags that I see are fake. And there's some there's some nice telltale signs for me, but not for people that don't know. <laughs> a so, lot of it's to do with the feet, isn't it? As the, um, the, the feet on a decent handbag screw in rather than uh, a knocked in. <laughs> It depends on I, I think I think on, on the speedies they are and they, they've got they've got it the actual the bottom of it was revolves and you've actually got a screw that goes into it um as opposed to as you say when they're when they're banged in by a sweatshop in uh in the far east it probably doesn't really you know have that yeah, much attention. going up to a girlfriend and attacking the bottom of her bag often they're not impressed <laughs> <laughs> no, and also, and also, the funny thing is, is I, I highly doubt that anyone with 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 a, with a slight bit of uh, decorum would would question the authenticity of somebody's handbag. So, so it's the same with people's watches. And the the, the, the irony is, is I, I've been sat at some fantastic dinner tables in the past with with, with some fantastic people, and I, and I've seen watches that I know are completely wrong. But of course, you would never mention it. But the, the, the fakes. I mean, is there something to look out for when you know? Let's say. Brokers are being shown handbags. The, the, the Any telltale the, signs? My, my favourite things, especially on Hermes, is um, when you when I mean, ultimately, nobody will buy these things not knowing what they're worth, and that's the classic thing you always get told. Oh, somebody gave it to me as a present. Somebody, yeah. somebody did this. Somebody that. And ultimately, yes, there is a distinct possibility with some of our clients that they possibly did get given a Hermes bag. However, it's highly unlikely that somebody would give somebody an off, you know, off the cuff present of a twenty thousand pound bag. Now, that that's the first thing that I, I always get concerned with. Saying somebody gave me this present. The second one is if you don't have um, Chanel, for example, come with a very handy card that's got a lovely serial number that you can actually check. Um, if you are a retailer or you're an auction house, you can actually check these things and you can phone them up and go, "Can you authenticate?" I think owning one, you keep you keep the covers, you keep the boxes because they are well, of course. Yeah. To, to the piece same if, with watches if i see a you know even a good hermes birkin um from the last five years and it hasn't got its original kind of taupe um dust bag and the beautiful orange box that it comes in that there, there's there's kind of alarm bells that start ringing because ultimately if you spent twenty thousand pounds on that yeah. you keep the box exactly the same way in which you keep a box for a watch and i think that's that's the thing where you know it's not always a guarantee and you need to have a proper look at it. But if somebody just hands me a, a Birkin and you can tell by your surroundings a little bit, you know, you're not going to have a £30,000 bag in a one up, one down in Scunthorpe. But it's, um, you know, it's it's a funny old world. And I have seen some of these in bizarre places. No. So we've talked about other handbags, um, not just the Hermes. Is there any others that we should be looking out for or that you, you know, any images that you've got there in your little box, Alistair, that you can... I think that, that there's a couple of really nice, let me just have a little look at this one, because this is, this is a good example of some, some really interesting bags that have come to market. So this one is, oh, a, wow. is a gorgeous little Chanel. And this is possible, well, it is the most expensive Chanel bag that was actually ever sold. And this is at the Métier d'Art. Um, uh, the Paris Shanghai, um, and this is black lucite matrioshka evening bag with gold hardware. Now, again, Chanel's never really in the same kind of league as uh, Hermes with price and things like this. So this made thirty two thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. But again, it's great fun. And we were talking about that that leather strap with the gold chain, and that's again, you know, at the forefront of the design of this one. So this is a nice, you know, it's it's a fun kind of example but what I like about it is you still got the double c you still got the quilting on there and you still got some of the elements that are actually in some really really you know normal Chanel handbags that you can go and buy for four or five grand. I was going to say um one of the handbag retailers um I think it might have been Chanel did a series that had uh paintings of our uh, you know paintings on them which yep. were beautiful yeah, um, uh, there, there are loads, there are loads of limited edition ones that come out there. I, I still get surprised sometimes when I see some in the flesh because they produce these things. Um, Louis Vuitton are, are, are prime for it. They'll release, I think they released the Mykonos edition. Every time they open a new boutique, they will kind of do 
a limited run of, of, of bags relating to that boutique. So I think the Mykonos range um, was bright blue with, a, with, with clouds in it. So it represented sunshine and things like that. And it's awfully nice, but Chanel obviously kind of taking that up a level and do it with paintings. And that there's, again, they produce so many different items these days that one could actually get completely overwhelmed with it. But it's, it will always be, and, and, as, a, and as an investment, I would always say, by the standards because everyone wants the standard i think that that's that's the key with it you know if you go and buy a black epsom leather birkin 35 with gold hardware you can pretty much guarantee that in two years time even after you've used it carefully i may add even after you've used it it will at least be worth what you paid for it if not a little bit more and i think that's that's the great thing however if you go and buy a gold lame with ostrich panel Louis Vuitton bag um, that basically is very, I think in, in our world we use the term esoteric quite a lot. Yeah. And um, I think something like that would certainly be esoteric. And if you have something that's kind of very out there, it's not going to have the same demand as that. It's, you know, it's the classic black dress of handbags, really, to be perfectly honest. You've got, you know, just, just a very, very simple design. And that, that's what the Birkin, the Kelly... The, the Louis Vuitton Speedy are all about. They're just well-designed bags that have a function. And whilst we're looking at all these designs and going, oh gosh, isn't this incredible? There, there was a design and there was a function for it before they went and put you know, crocodile leather and diamond buckles and things like that. There, there was a purpose to the bag. And I think you, you go with the basics and you're always guaranteed that they will make you money and just still retain an element of cool, I think. So do you find that obviously with handbags, there is a value and we're seeing investment purchases and we're seeing secondary markets. What about the wallets and the purse and the, you know, the, the coin purses and things like that? Do they carry the same level of value and interest? Interesting point. Um, I think if you were to turn up with a Hermes, um, I think it's called the classic, which doesn't really help many people envisage what it looks like, but it's basically like a, a nice long kind of maybe six to eight inches, something around those kind of things. And if you have one of those with a matching Birkin or a matching Kelly, it will take the price of the Kelly or the Birkin up you know a, a decent kind of 10 percent something like that because people want the matching you know the matching purse with the bag however if you have one of them on on their own because you can you know generally speaking because you can buy them and if you want to go and buy one you can usually be able to go into new bond street and buy one for maybe a couple of grand or something like that they're not as investment worthy however again just to completely go back on what i said there are certain colors and certain leathers and certain materials that obviously in the same way that the Birkin and the Kelly do have absolutely rocketed again. So it's, again, it's Funny, a tricky. I, I used to always buy the matching purse to the handbag. Mm -hmm. yep. I can't tell you when I last used a purse because well, you don't use coins anymore. Well, I was actually having a discussion not so long ago with somebody saying the last time I took cash out was I think in 2019. So <laughs> um, it goes to show that actually you just you just have a little card wallet these days. Or oh, actually, it sounds bad, but everything's on your phone, isn't it? So you just you just That's swipe great. the phone. Yeah. So again, the need the need for um, purses and coin wallets and things like that, unfortunately, isn't what it was. So, uh, Alistair, let's say you you had some pennies to spend and you wanted to buy a gift what would you be your chosen gift well would it be a gift for me or a gift for somebody else well i was gonna say <laughs> let's say as we're talking handbags <laughs> well I, I could quite happily sit and look at one to be to be honest but no, i think if, if I, I know you uh, like a man bag but uh you know well, which there are, I mean, to be as collectible no, no, that's a, it's a really good point and one I wasn't kind of going to touch on. But actually, man bags, I mean, I've got a, a reasonable selection of man bags. And ultimately, people generally just go for a Mulberry or, you know, a Louis Vuitton one yeah. or something like that. There's some nice Hermes ones out there, but I don't think there is, there is I mean, it's li most man bags are literally messenger bags or kind of briefcase type things that don't have the, the same kind of style element or, or design factors to them. And I think it, I think it might be a, a girl thing. Or, or, or maybe just a me thing, I don't know. But it's um, it, it, pe people want the design element to it. And I don't think you get that with, with, with man bags. But going back to your original question about what I would buy, 
if if I had the funds then, and if I were buying them as a, as a gift for somebody, I think the Kelly is is a beautiful, beautiful bag, and it does pretty much exactly what the Birkin does for half the price. And I, I think you can actually, with the right color combination, I think it does look actually nicer. It's but it. it it may be a little bit more formal, the Birkin, because it's a little bit stiffer and it's a, you know the form of it is a little bit more yeah. set. Um, but I mean, a nice a nice Birkin that's you know in in a good car. Like the oversized Birkin. Well, it's like a tote bag almost, it isn't is. it? You can go <laughs> you can go to Waitrose with it and and, and fill it up. And uh, actually, having said that, probably probably not in Kensington, but yeah, um, <laughs> you, you could you could fill anything up with it, and actually, it would work well. Oh. Well, Alistair, thank you so much for today. Not um, at all. It's always lovely to talk handbags. Uh, I was going to say, we haven't quite concentrated on shoes or trainers, but I know that you've written various articles um, for us on that. So thank you. Um, I was going to say, we've got the excitement next week with David Dallas. Um, I so enjoy listening to our specialists on their chosen subjects um, and I hope you get out of it as much as I do uh, listening to them. I love it. Um, but David Dallas is talking about the Dutch influence on English paintings. So um, that will be a very interesting one. And then we've got a whole series for the rest of the month, which has been sent out. And we're currently looking at our June schedule. So if you do have anything that you'd like us to cover, please do let us know. We are always looking for ideas. If you're after an article or if you've got a client that has got a particular collection and that you'd like us to write an article for you, or even as brokers, if you'd like to work together on anything, please do give us a shout. We, we love working with you and uh, delighted to do what we can. So Alistair, any words further from you? No, it's always a pleasure, Rachel. And uh, yes, next week with David should be should be absolutely fascinating. One of my my favourite periods in old masters paintings as well, with the, the Dutch influence in in Britain around that kind of time. So I'm looking forward to that one as well. Well, I'm glad you're doing the interview next week. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much, everyone. Have a lovely rest of your afternoon, and uh, we look forward to catching up soon. Bye from us. Bye bye.